Hey guys, welcome back. Today we will be going over seven curious topics in Tears of the Kingdom. Topics that range from Easter egg to heavy lore implication. These are things that I've noticed yet haven't seen others talk about in their videos. You guys know that I'm always looking for little things that stick out. And while some of these I might work into theories later on, they mostly stand on their own. Oh, and stay tuned till the end where I talk about a giveaway that my buddy Hyrule Town is doing. For now, kick back and relax while I walk you through 7 curious details in Tears of the Kingdom. Number 1. The Spectacle Rock Cave I've decided to start things off with two classic Zelda references in the game. The first one is Spectacle Rock. It appears time and time again dating back all the way to the first game. There, it was the entrance to level 9, Ganon's Lair. Being guarded by Moblins and more Lynels than you can shake a stick at, you had to blow it open with a bomb in order to enter. Once inside, you would be stopped unless you have all 8 pieces of the Triforce of Wisdom. In Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, Spectacle Rock again appears in the game. It is the location that Urbosa moves Valna Boris to in order to set up the attack on the Calamity. In Tears of the Kingdom, when we look under the location in the depths, we find an unusual location with two solid pillars from the masses above ground going into deep pools of water. What is more interesting is that one of these two pillars has a big hole in it, seemingly allowing water to flow through it. In a past video, I mentioned how deep this water was. It was then that I realized that this is a Zelda 1 reference. The hole is here as a reference to the first game, where you blew a hole in Spectacle Rock. I want to be clear. I don't think that this is any heavy lore about Breath and Tears coming after Zelda 1, or any type of admission that these games are in the Fallen timeline. Like many of the references in these games, I feel that this is yet another superficial one that merely references a past game. Still, if you are set on ramming these games into the old timeline regardless of how little sense it makes, go ahead and use this to try to justify a placement. Just don't ask why Spectacle Rock is now located so far away from Death Mountain, okay? Number 2. The Zelda 2 Goddess Statue the next reference is a Zelda 2 one that I was alerted to by my buddy, Captain Burgerson. It actually turns out that the day I'm recording this was his birthday. So, happy birthday, buddy. Anyhow, if we look over at the Akala stables, up by the research lab, there is a well with a curious little thing in it. When you go down into it, you will find a small cave with some glowing fish. Nothing really of note except for a small hole in the wall. Ducking through that wall, you will find something unusual, a lone goddess statue. On the surface, this may not seem like anything that special. It's unusual for sure, why is there a goddess statue here? Well, it suddenly makes sense if you consider Zelda 2 and the desert cave at the start of the game. In there, there was also a small cave with a random goddess statue at the end. A lady from the nearby mountain town of Ruto asked Link to bring it back. In the North American version, the statue was modified and the name was changed to a trophy, but in the Japanese version, it was called a goddess statue. That's right, as far back as Zelda 2, there were references to goddess Hylia, though a retcon one. I can understand if you want to take this one with some skepticism. Now to move on to the more lore-heavy stuff. Before we do, let me ask if you're enjoying the video. If you are, a like and subscribe would really help out. My channel needs growth, and I do put out a video every week. Enough of that stuff, let's move on. Number 3. The Hover Spikes I've noticed that there are different sets of hover spikes on the bottom of the Sky Islands. I call these hover spikes because they are, well, spikes, but also because they have hover stone in them. We can see that stone clearly sticking out from them, especially on the more decayed ones. I have done a bit of research on these and have found that they fall into a few different sizes. We first have the small ones, which are found on the bottom of the small structures we see around the Great Sky Island. They are exactly 10 meters or 32 feet tall. Then there are some medium sized ones that we find on small islands. These islands often contain a single house or some other small structure. They are 30 meters tall or 98 feet. The large ones that we see in places like the bottom of the boss platforms, they are an impressive 60 meters or 196 feet tall. 
And finally, the huge ones that we see, which are used to keep large islands in the sky like we see under the Great Sky Island, are a whopping 120 meters or 394 feet tall. Let me just point out that the soccer field is 110 meters or 360 feet long. And so, a huge hover spike on its side would be longer than one of those fields. The thing that I find most interesting though, is that some of these have different designs. There are some that are fractured and have chunks missing out of them. This may actually be by design. We can see this design commonly used under the Thunder Isles, along with the few that have fallen to the surface that we can find around the map. These grounded hover spikes are a mystery in themselves. It isn't clear why they fell or where they fell from. Believe me, I've checked. Honestly, they deserve a video all on their own, so stay tuned for that. Going back to the Great Sky Island, we can see that the structure of these spikes is more pristine. Some of them do have damage, but it looks as though it's from general weathering. And more important, they lack the big holes that we saw in the previous ones. If we look under the Temple of Time, we can see another set of these spikes. They are more decorative, like they were made from the same stone as the temple itself. It's worth noting that this big one under the center is a different size entirely. 75 meters, or 246 feet tall. That central one shows heavy signs of damage as well. It makes me wonder if that damage might have occurred when it was lifted into the air. Sadly, we may never know. If we look around the ruins of Hyrule, we often see more hover spikes. They are often damaged with this green hover stone visible in them. There are, however, plenty of floating rocks that seem to lack this green stone entirely. This makes me wonder how they are able to stay in the air. In some structures, we can see spots of this green stone that clearly connects to others. This is very apparent, but not exclusive to the Water Temple. Someday, I will see about piecing that structure back together in Blender. But who knows, maybe another content creator will do it first. Number 4. Hoverstone in the Labyrinths The Sky Labyrinths are some of the most impressive structures in the game. It is unclear if they were built in the sky or if they were built on the ground and later raised. If we look at the bottom, we can get some clues about that. You can see that there are broken parts of them that reveal the hover stone that keeps them in the air. You can also see this white stone under them with a more tribal inspired exterior. It's a similar phenomenon to what we see over at Tobias Hollows. If you ask me, my guess is that these sky labyrinths were originally built on top of the bottom labyrinths and then raised into the sky. Each of the floating labyrinths also exists in a state of low gravity. Which makes sense given that the walls are exactly 100 meters, or 328 feet tall. Why the bottom of these walls is broken is a mystery. Especially when you consider there is no debris on the ground or anything like that. We also know that these labyrinths predate any divide in the population. If such a divide happened after the passing of the Zonai, then the external tribal coverings of these walls and their interior white stone raises some serious questions. As interesting as that all is, at this point, I'm skeptical we will ever get a reason behind it. Let's move on. Number 5. Debris Fusing On the topic of sky objects, one thing that really catches my attention are the sheer number of them that have fused into the ground below. I say fuse because if we look at the ground where they have fallen, we see an interesting pattern that appears a lot in the game. I believe that this is a fusion pattern. It is as though they have fallen into objects and fused with them while continuing their descent. It really is the only way to explain what is going on with these, because the objects would have fallen straight down and not at odd angles. This isn't like a game of Tetris, where after a long vertical fall, the objects can be shunted to the side suddenly. So the only logical conclusion is that they fell into the terrain while phasing through matter, and ultimately ended up fusing here in this final position. This of course resembles what we see with the Zonai stakes, but in their case they don't go completely through objects. As to where, if we look closely we can see that some sky debris is sticking through objects completely. Coming back to the fusion pattern, 
we can see this pattern in a few spots not related to this debris. The first, and more meta one, is the actual loading screen. It appears at the top and bottom, as though the panel is fusing into the screen itself. I don't think that this has any real lore implications. It's clearly just a meta concept being applied to the loading screen for the sake of aesthetics. The other location of this fuse pattern is far more obvious, someplace we have seen countless times throughout the game, right here on Link's body. I once speculated that Raru amputated Link's corrupted arm and then replaced it with his own, but it would seem what really happened is a case of fusion. That Raru merely used his power to fuse his arm onto Link's body. Perhaps the restoration of the arm is merely the fusion ending, that it is no longer needed, with Link's body now being purified from all of those blessings of light through the shrines. As such, that would explain why there are no scars. I am really curious as to your thoughts on this one, so please leave a comment. Number 6. Castle Lights Another minor detail that I've brought up before in passing are the lights in Hyrule Castle Sanctum. You can light the sconces around here. Of course, lighting the two braziers up by the throne will reveal all secret chambers with the champion's leathers, but that is explicitly told to you in Zelda's journal. These other wall decorations don't do much outside of providing a little bit of light, but an interesting detail with them is that they continue to provide light even during cutscenes. This also applies to Breath of the Wild, though your access to them is far more limited. You basically need to use fire arrows in order to light them at range, otherwise you will trigger the final cutscenes. If you do so, then during that cutscene, they will continue to be lit. In Tears of the Kingdom, this also applies to the cutscene with Puppet Zelda. So if you ever watch those scenes online and see that the sconces are lit, well, now you know why. Number 7. The Zora Rangers My final detail for the video is a more playful one. You might have noticed that after completing some of the regional phenomenon quest, that reinforcements will show up at Lookout Landing to help Hyrule. The Rito send some archers, the Gerudo send some guards, the Gorons send a couple of kids that are… well, I'm sure they're doing something useful. As for the Zora, they send a group that can be seen practicing by the water, and if you look carefully, each one of them is a different color. Green, yellow, blue, and pink, all being led by a red one. If you have some basic knowledge of the Power Ranger franchise, or Super Sentai as it is known in Japan, then you may realize that this is a clear reference to that franchise. While this may seem like a superficial comparison on the surface, consider this. In The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, a group of multicolored heroes come together to fight against an emerging evil, and that evil was sealed away 10,000 years ago. Sound familiar? And yes, I realized that in Crow Yu Sentai Ju Ranger, that the evil witch Pandora was sealed away in dinosaur times, and so it isn't a one to one comparison. Considering that Super Mario RPG also has a Super Sentai reference in it, I think that this is just a cheeky reference the developers threw in for a smile. It certainly got one from me. Thanks for watching the episode, guys. If you would like to participate in a giveaway, my buddy over at Hyrule Town is doing one for his 1000 subscriber celebration. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description if you are interested. It's a chance to win some gift cards, and all you have to do is subscribe. Speaking of which, if you liked this video, please give it a like and subscribe for future content. If you are unaware, I've started up Final Fridays where I am streaming the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster games. I am wrapping up the first game this Friday and hope to see you there. Rest assured, I'm not going anywhere and plan to continue Zelda content, but I will be adding some Final Fantasy content going forward on my weekly structure. If you guys like what I'm doing and are in a position to help out more, consider joining my Patreon or becoming a channel member. Doing so will give you access to my Discord, where we can talk more directly about upcoming events. It really does help out, and that is what is making the channel possible right now. Check out last week's channel update if you haven't already. Well, that's all I got for you today, guys. Be safe, and may the way of the hero lead to the Triforce.